Okay, sure. Betsy, well, thank you so much for taking the time today to share your journey with cholangiocarcinoma. Certainly, I appreciate the connection to you through the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation. Look forward to, to learning more about your journey and helping to inform others who may be encountering the diagnosis and or uh, undergoing a journey through treatment. So uh, with that, we'd like to start with a bit of introduction. So if you could go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, yeah. So my name is Betsy Grayson. Um, I'm 35 years old and I live in Minneapolis. Um, I've been living here pretty much my whole life. I went to college at the University of Minnesota and yeah, I have, have been living here ever since. And um, I, I most of my career was in advertising, a lot of copywriting and, and campaign building. I apologize if my this is Bumby. He might jump Hi. in once in a while. Um, Hi, Bumby. <laughs> he's actually, he's from a, um, I wrote a kitty litter campaign and he was from the video shoot and I brought him home. <laughs> so he likes the camera. Um, oh, that's wonderful. So hopefully he won't get in the way too much. I don't know if you saw my, my WCCO little interview, but he, that was this week talking about cholangiocarcinoma carcinoma and Bumby kept jumping in. But anyway. How did you come up with the name Bumby? That's a unique name. Sure, yeah. Um, I was an English major. I, I used to love literature and Ernest Hemingway used to call his his fat baby Bumby. <laughs> I just thought it would make a good pet name. And so I, I brought home this cat and then his litter mate um, or brother named one Atticus and, and this one Bumby and he just happened to grow into his name and it worked. He's the friendly chubby one and Atticus is the, the neurotic, you know, typical cat one. He's up there just watching us. He won't bother us, but. Sure, no worries. Yeah. So a career in advertising, and it sounds like one of the things that you've done was was for Kitty Litter. What other things have you worked on? Yeah, so a lot of it was, I spent four years at an agency that focused on agriculture. So I did a lot of swine and, and cow health campaigns, a lot of mastitis products for dairy cows, but it was really fun. We actually did like a, a virtual reality game for one of the products. So, you know, it's more fun than you'd think pharmaceutical animal health products would be. But then I've, I've also done some more fun brands, you could say like Sephora makeup and, and um, Hormel Foods I worked on for a while. Um, but yeah, I, the, the most of my career, kind of the peak of it was at the agriculture agency. So I did a lot of and some consumer products like um, some turkey brands and beef brands and, and things like that. So it was a lot of fun. Um, I was really, really, really invested in my career. And that's been one of the hardest parts with this um, this change with this diagnosis and, and going through treatments is I tried to do a freelance for a little bit when I was first diagnosed and, and work part time. But it just got really difficult with especially a lot of quick turn revisions where uh, clients would need a change in like an hour and I'd be, you know, like in the hospital bed or something. So I ultimately chose to go on disability in August and feels like, feels like retirement at 35, which, you know, has its pros and cons, I suppose. Yeah, it's certainly been difficult leaving that something I was so invested in for so long. I think that's one of the hardest parts of, of being a young adult with cancer is, you know, just when you're career is taking off, you hit this gigantic, you know, um, roadblock, but I still hope to go back. I might not go back to something so, so consuming, maybe, maybe something where I'm working pretty strictly to 40 hours a week rather than, you know, I was working more like 60 to 70 hours a week. And I just think um, with a cancer diagnosis, and even if I get to post-treatment, I just don't want to be stressing my body out that much. Sure, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm originally from Guam, so you, when you mentioned hormonal foods, I thought of spam instantly. So I don't know. If oh, of course, yeah, yeah. I wrote a lot of spam ads. You oh, know. that is wonderful. I can't say I'm a, I'm a fan myself, but no yeah. worries, no worries. Yeah, it's very popular in the islands because you know back to World War II, and uh, maybe you know yeah. all about history because of the. the yeah, the we did a lot of we did a lot of um, ads and campaigns targeted strictly to the you know demographic and audience. You know, Wonderful. using recipes that would maybe be more popular in Guam or Hawaii. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. And and certainly, I I can understand the investment that you've made in your career and and the life that you you had prior to the diagnosis. Um, let Let's go back to to the beginning. When did you first think that something might have been wrong that you wanted to seek attention for? You know, spring of 2020, as the world was you know deep 
deep into this pandemic we thought would only last a, a couple of months. I first started having a little bit of lower back pain and I've, I've never had any back problems. And, you know, my friends would all kind of tease me like, welcome to your thirties. And that's just the way it is. And I think my primary doctor might've said, well, we'd expect that, you know, during the pandemic, people are more sedentary and, and sitting and yeah, just, you know, back pain, nobody thinks anything of it. But then it got a lot more serious when one day in July, I woke up with double vision and uh, it was pretty pronounced and it wouldn't go away. I do, there's, you know, certain exercises you can do for vertigo to, to relieve that. And, and that wasn't helping. And so, and I remember driving down to my dad's, I grew up south of Minneapolis, not very far, but I had to cover one eye just to get there because um, it was, you know, I didn't want to see double cars. So I, I just kept thinking about it over, over the course of two days and eventually called the nurse hotline. And I went over my symptoms with her and she very calmly, but kind of urgently said, okay, get a, get a responsible adult to drive you to the emergency room right away. So, you know, I, I read, you know, it could be something like a tumor or, or an aneurysm. And I, you know, I, I used to be really anxious about those kinds of things, but I've, I'd gotten over it. So I, you know, it was just like, there's no chance. I, I'm going to go to the ER and they'll send me home with some at a van and tell me to wear my glasses, but that's, that's not what happened. Unfortunately, my dad took me to the ER. I had him just drop me off because, you know, it was uh, like peak pandemic times and, you know, so many people have, have been avoiding ERs because of coronavirus and everything. But at, at this hospital, they had two paths kind of one for the COVID patients and one for everyone else. And I was the only person in line for everyone else. So I got in right away. You know, I, I, I was like the only patient in that wing of the hospital, but I was pretty calm and, and they did a CT, brain CT, and they came back and they, they said, we found something. And <laughs> those are the words I'll never forget hearing. We found something. I was like, oh God. And, and, and the surgeon was really concerned. He kept saying, um, I can't appreciate the level of severity of this. Now I know that's kind of common medical talk. I'm just saying I I can't appreciate or I can appreciate. But then they did a MRI to take another look and they, they said, yeah, it's certainly something, some kind of mass. We don't think it's as, as urgent as we initially thought. They decided to set me up with the neurosurgeon and send me home and you know, a neurosurgeon would take it from there. So I met with him and and a lot of my early appointments and still to this day are, are done over Zoom because of the pandemic. So I met my neurosurgeon over Zoom and talked through things with him. He he was pretty confident it was probably a benign tumor that had just been growing really slowly over the years and, and was pushing on my sixth nerve, which was causing the, the double vision. And I'd also mentioned the back pain to him at this point, and he he too um didn't think it was anything to worry about. This will this will come into play later. <laughs> so so could you describe that back pain because it, it's it's sort of what you you mentioned as the first symptom. How severe or persistent was it, and yeah. how would you describe it relative to other pains that you might have had? Sure. You know, it, it kind of felt like I just pulled a muscle or something in my back. It was pretty chronic, but not very severe. And um, I could easily write off myself, just kind of like, I guess, yeah, this is what adulthood feels like. So yeah, it, yeah, it felt a lot like I'd pulled a muscle or something in, in my lower back. Um, by, by chronic, do you mean? Constant. It was just always, always there. Um, but for how long, maybe? Maybe weeks oh, or days or weeks? or That started around maybe May of 2020. And then, um, you know, we're going into July with, with these other symptoms. So it was a few weeks that it started. So, um, so a few weeks of consistent, not severe, but concerning back pain. Is yeah. That yeah. Certainly something I've never experienced before, but I, I've been pretty lucky. I, I can't say I was a super active person. I, I was pretty athletic as a younger person, but... In my adulthood, um, I actually walked a lot. I uh, walked six or seven or more miles a day um, every day. I lived by some lakes and I really enjoyed walking to these lakes and, and there's a lot of wildlife there. And, and that was a big part of my routine. So I thought I was in, you know, I was in really great shape. I'd, I'd lost some weight throughout that year. And I don't know whether or not that was related to the disease because I've been trying to lose weight for a few years. And finally that last year it came off pretty easily. So I wouldn't say it was unintentional, but yeah, it was certainly enough that a lot of people noticed and commented on it. And, you know, some even, you know, thought it was too much weight, but I, I was happy. I felt confident. I felt like I looked good. You know, this was 
Yeah, I, I was. How much weight had you lost over what period of time? Maybe 25 or 30 pounds over over six months. So not not a huge amount. Like I said, I, I pretty much was always trying to to lose about that amount of weight. So it just kind of felt like, oh, this is working now. But I, I do remember saying to my friends, like, I didn't even have to try very hard. And, and pounds kind of melted away. So and, yeah. and doing anything differently from a diet or exercise perspective during this time? Not really. I mean, I, I was still walking a lot then. I'd say I was maybe like snacking less in the evening, which, you know, especially in, in Minnesota winters, that's easy to do. But maybe that was the biggest difference. And, and I just thought that was, you know, what uh, led to the weight loss. Like, oh, um, that made a really big difference. Just cutting out my, my triscuits and cheese after dinner or whatever. So. Sure. And so end up, you know, with a mass in the brain. And that's, that's a scary thing to hear. Could you talk about how you were processing that emotionally? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it was ironic because when I was younger, like in my 20s, I think a brain tumor was one of my biggest fears. I, I was actually medicated for being a hypochondriac. Like I thought at certain times I, I had a brain tumor or an aneurysm or... Yeah, and just being a being a writer by trade, I suppose I felt like I was slipping on my, on my words more over the past six months to a year. And my mom actually had early onset Alzheimer's, so I had a lot of fear that that it was maybe Alzheimer's or. But a tumor had crossed my mind. So at this stage, you know, it, it was certainly alarming. I think I've learned with with this illness, you kind of immediately go into this survival mode often of like, okay what's next? What do we, this is what's happening. What do we do about it? So that's kind of how I was feeling. I think, I think in a way, because it had been one of my biggest fears and I historically been a hypochondriac, I felt prepared to face it. I was more calm than I expected to be. Something about like facing my biggest fear felt empowering in a way, I guess. Okay, this is it. I can do this. And, and at the time, you know, I thought, um, I talked to the surgeon, he was pretty confident it was benign. It was difficult to tell what kind of tumor it was. It was at the base of my skull. And I remember it took a long time to, to pronounce the different kinds of tumors that now I've forgotten. It was like a schwana, some, schwana something. I don't remember. But there were like three different kinds of tumors that, that they thought it was, but they were, I want to say they said they were 97% sure it was a benign brain tumor. That was just growing really slowly and just had gotten to the point where it hit the nerve just enough to to make my vision go double so they kind of gave me three options we could leave it and watch and see right away i i was not up for that approach because i had double vision i, I didn't want to just continue my my life seeing double um the other approach was radiation um and then the third approach was surgery and um with surgery we'd be able to you know, biopsy the tumor and, and find out what it really is. And we'd also, um, it sounded like it'd be harder to do radiation after surgery because at the time I asked if we could do both or something or try radiation and then do surgery. But I was told it'd be hard to do, that's what it was. It'd be hard to do surgery after radiation. So I also learned that they wouldn't have to, you know, break open my skull and then do, you know, what you think of brain surgery. They, they actually went through my nasal cavity. So uh, that was certainly, you know, made the, the surgery less threatening. It was far less invasive than it maybe would have been 10 years ago. You know, they have a ENT surgeon along with the neurosurgeon going in my nasal cavity and resecting the tumor. So I chose that option pretty quickly. I was like, okay, let's get this tumor out and, and I'll go on with my life and <laughs> kind of look back on this as a, just a weird road bump that, that happened when I was 34. So uh, they scheduled the surgery a month from the date it was discovered. I think it was found on, on July 13th. The surgery was going to be August 13th. But before the surgery, they had to do what they called a balloon test. Um, I don't know the medical term, but that's what they, the layman's term, where they, they bring me in and they kind of put a balloon up against my corroded artery to see how I perform if they lost that artery during surgery. Because apparently a lot of people can go a few minutes without that artery working. And they just wanted to make sure I fit into that 
you know, large percentage of people because the tumor was so close to that artery. This way they would know if they could be more aggressive with resecting it. So for this procedure, I was awake and they had me, they had me like talking and, and seeing the likelihood of a stroke because I'd have a stroke if this, um, the alternative, I'd, either I'd do fine without the carotid artery or I'd have a stroke. So they were testing that, you know, threat level. And I remember hearing them say before I went into the room, the tumor had grown. I heard someone say it doubled in size over the, that four week period. So right away then I knew, okay, this, this probably is something bigger than we thought. But I was starting to panic, but I still was fairly calm. But I remember going in this room and, and you know, you're awake and, and there's probably, I don't know, maybe 15 medical professionals in this room all talking to me and doing different things. And, and it, it's really this complex, like this high level experience. And, and they were pressing the artery and talking to me. And right away, I was slurring my, my words and in a lot of pain. And, and, you know, I could like trying to say my name and stuff, I was really struggling and really slurring. And so, so what they learned from that whole process is that they can't, you know, take out my carotid artery when they're in there. They're, they have to be really careful because I was in the population, I would probably have a stroke if they, if they nicked it or something. So th they brought me back and they, they said, you know, it's really, really good. We did this. It lets us know what we can and can't do in surgery. So just look at it as that way. It was really productive. And so the next day was the surgery. I went in, my dad was there for a little bit, but dropped me off. This is still during COVID time. So no visitors and then a lot of strict protocols there. I knew I was going to be in the hospital for five days for recovery following the surgery. So then, yeah, they put me under. And I was under for eight hours. It was an eight hour surgery. You know, I woke up and, you know, it's so weird when you go under because the world goes on and things continue. But for you, it's just a blink of an eye and, and eight hours have gone by. And I wake up and, and I'm in the ICU for the first, for the first couple of nights. And, it, and it's a really nice room and a really nice nurse. And feel really well taken care of. They decided they wanted to do a full body CT scan right then just to see if there was inflammation anywhere else in my body. So right after the surgery, you know, right when I was waking up, we went and I did the full body CT scan and brought me back to the ICU and, you know, spent the night there. I think I, I can't remember what movie was playing. I, I, I think Stand By Me was playing on repeat or something, which is one of my favorite movies. So yeah, then the next morning I woke up and the, the neurosurgeon came in. He, he asked where my dad was. We were allowed to have one visitor after and, and my dad wasn't around. I, I think he didn't know that he was supposed to be there or something. So I just kind of said to the surgeon, like, what did you find? Like, Cause he, he was talking to me about the CT findings and he was, he was like, we, yeah, we, we found something. Where's your dad? He really wanted my dad to be there with me for the conversation, but I, I didn't care. I just wanted to know. I, I said, you found something in my back, didn't you? And he said, yeah, we found something in your back and your liver. So at this time I'm learning, I have three tumors in my body because then, then I learned they didn't, they didn't resect all of the brain tumor. They got, I don't even know if they got half of it. Um, but they treated the procedure as really positive because they got enough to biopsy and, you know, I did really well. So, you know, I don't know how much of it was them like spinning it to just make me feel better, but they were like, yeah, it went really great. We're really happy with things, but I'm learning. Okay. There's, there's other masses. And, and at the time I have no idea what this means. I mean, there hasn't really been any cancer in my family. I just don't know anything about cancer at this time. So they take me down then to another room to recover. This was before cancer. So you have roommate. I've learned since that in the hospital, every time I've gone, I get my own room being immunocompromised with cancer. But this time I had, I had a pretty awful roommate who, who talked all night and yelled a lot. Oh, no. So they put me they put me in my own room. I didn't even have to ask. They, they just kind of said, get you out of here. So, you know, it, it was... It was my first time in the hospital. And I also remember there was a really, really bad storm. I think the third night I was there and, and the alarms kept saying like, they needed to move us. The nurses kept saying, no, 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 it's fine. It, it's just, you know, over, over caution. But anyway, so yeah, at this point I learned I have three tumors and I'm going to be discharged in a couple of days. And, you know, I think they just wanted me to focus on recovering from that, from the brain surgery at the time. So they discharged me. They start, you know, making phone calls. My, my neurosurgeon called and, and he said, you know, we can't tell what it is, but we should assume it's cancer. 
or they didn't even say cancer. She said we should assume it's malignant. And I've been updating my friends and family on Facebook. And it wasn't until someone else said, oh my God, I hate cancer, that I realized it was cancer, which is so silly to me in hindsight that it took that long just because we've been using such other medical terms. The neurosurgeon said, so they have pathologists in the room looking at the tissue, trying to diagnose it, even as the surgery is happening and everything's inconclusive and they sent it out. And so there was this two week period of just, they, they don't know what it is. All their pathology results are, are inconclusive. But in the meantime, they're having me go forward with gamma knife radiation to my brain to treat the rest of the tumor that wasn't resected. And that was kind of a hellish experience because you put on this Hannibal Lecter-like mask and, and then you go under, you're pinned down about an hour each session in this little tube. So if you're at all claustrophobic, it's pure hell, which I, I really struggled with that. But you know, I, I, I'm, like I said, I was in this, this mindset of, of what do we have to do and let's do it. Um, so I remember at my last surgeon, the, the radiologist came out and he said, I have great news. Your, your genomic testing has come back and we think we know what it is. So the genomic testing is when they send the, the tumor tissue out to see what kind of mutations the tumor has. It's kind of a, it's kind of a newer process, but it's really, really important. You know, this will determine what targeted therapies would work for me and whatnot. And that's ultimately how they diagnosed me based on the mutations they found, plus the aggressive presentation. And I remember the radiologist said, I, I don't know if he said cholangiocarcinoma or, or not. I think he did. And I think it was one, they had a, a theory of like five different cancers and that was like number five. And I think it was the one with the most grim statistics. And, and I just started crying and I said, I wanted thyroid cancer because that's one that's often more treatable. And, and, and that was when they were theorizing. And I, and I was so mad at him. I said, why couldn't you have told me this after the radiation? Cause I, I have to go into this little machine with my head clamped down now thinking about this and knowing the grim statistics, you know, Google is, <laughs> is often, you know, it exaggerates or it's old data or anything, but when you Google cholangiocarcinoma, the five-year survival rate is 2%. If it's spread, it's, it's one year is, is the, and, and I'm like, I'm 34 years old at the time and I'm just crying and I'm so mad at this radiologist. And so essentially that's how I learned what I had. Yeah. And that was hard. And I, I was so angry at the time. And, and so I went home and I was going to the U of M University of Minnesota for treatments and, and they didn't know which oncologist to set me up with because, you know, it's such a rare cancer. They didn't have, you know, a, a oncologist dedicated to that, but they found one for me. He was brand new. He was just hired. I may have been his first patient. He was a GI oncologist and he gave me a call to talk me through it. I really have a great relationship with this oncologist now and in the beginning and you can tell we've both learned a lot over the past year and a half but in the beginning you know he called me and we're on the phone and and, and he's throwing you know all, all of the medical basically another language to me but he's trying to make me feel better he, he's saying you have this mutation so it might be three years for you but i'm hoping five but hopefully there'll be medical advancements that'll give you more time. And so, yeah, that, that actually did calm me down a lot. And, and that kind of built the foundation of, of my attitude toward this disease is, okay, medicine's moving fast and a lot is changing. And if I can hold on long enough, you know, it, it's, it's likely that something that's really game changing will come along. So that's how I learned. I had stage four cholangiocarcinoma, although um, I'd go to the Mayo Clinic for a second opinion. Because I think, you know, with any disease this this severe, but especially one that's so rare, it's I think it's really important to just have someone else's eyes on it. Plus, my Minneapolis oncologist, like I said, he was so new. I wanted someone at the Mayo Clinic who was really, really experienced. And, and I did get a really, like, a veteran in cholangiocarcinoma. He was a very nice older man, and he, he looked over my my file and imaging. And they actually pointed out that my spine had fractured at this time. I didn't know. Um, yeah. In Minneapolis, they were saying it, it, it was an impending spinal fracture. Um, at Mayo, they pulled up the imaging and said, no, look, it's fractured. So my back pain was, I guess, validated by then. I'm, I'm pretty shocked it didn't hurt more than it did at the time. But 
so the plan in Minneapolis was to get me in for back surgery to not only ablate that tumor, but also fix the broken spine with, I think it's clinoplasty is the term, with medicinal cement. So I don't want to switch gears too much, but I, I, I was on the phone with that neurosurgeon. They switched me to a different neurosurgeon and she explained normally they do like screws for this kind of procedure, but she said she didn't think I had a lot of years. So I, I was talking to the new neurologist who'd be working on my spine. She said normally they do screws to reinforce the spine, but they didn't know how many years I had left and if it was worth it to do that invasive of a procedure. So we decided on on the medicinal cement, which is often just more temporary and less invasive. So that was happening kind of parallel to me going to the Mayo Clinic for my second opinion. And at the Mayo Clinic, this oncologist, I really liked him and his fellow. Um, they really, really applauded the care I'd been getting in Minneapolis. Um, they said, especially that balloon test I'd mentioned earlier to check out my carotid artery, they were like, that tells us like really what incredible care you're getting there. They're really careful and really smart. And they said they would do the exact same treatment protocol that was lined up for me. So I kind of had the option of, you know, continue going to Mayo, which is about an hour drive for me, or having Mayo like overlook my imaging, but you know, having treatments in Minneapolis. But in the end, I just decided to keep everything in Minneapolis and then have the Mayo Clinic on hand if I needed them or wanted their opinion. And that oncologist, unfortunately he retired shortly after that appointment, but he said one thing that I've held on to a really long time. He said, he said our goal is gonna be to keep the cancer under control until we can one day cure the incurable. So I've really held on to that. You know, it's other people have associated cholangiocarcinoma with whack-a-mole. You, you get one tumor down, another one might pop up and you play that game, which is essentially the game I've been playing for the past year and a half um, and fortunately winning. So I, I had the spinal surgery after I got back from Mayo. And in all this time, you know, we're deciding what chemo I'll be set up on. And, and we wanted to start that right away. I remember my Minneapolis oncologist was even concerned we were waiting while I went to Mayo for the second opinion because he just, you know, it's such an aggressive cancer. He really wanted me to start treatments right away, but they wanted me to do this back surgery and, and it took a month for me to get in for the back surgery. And I remember that month was so hard because they tell you, you have this really aggressive cancer we need to treat right away. And then they just kind of leave you in the dark for a month with nothing happening and no news. And I was so furious and so scared, but I was also on a lot of steroids at the time because they'd given them to help with side effects from the radiation I'd had to my brain. So I'd had a lot of nausea. So, you know, steroids treat that. So I was full of energy while freaking out. I, I think I rearranged my apartment three different times in that month. It was beautiful outside in Minneapolis. So I was trying to, you know, soak up as much outdoor time as I could before I, I finally got in for this back surgery. And I learned in that month, two more tumors had grown in my spine, like alongside the, the main one that had fractured it. So that, you know, I, I'd been telling them during the brain radiation, like my spine is hurting more. I'm really concerned about waiting. And they, they weren't concerned. It was really hard. And then it was a little validating when, when we learned the reason I was concerned I had more tumors growing, it was spreading. So they did the spinal surgery. They kind of positioned it as you're going to have less pain right away. It's going to be great. We're sending you home right after. That's, that's not exactly how it went. I, I woke up, I was in so much pain. It was far worse than the brain tumor pain. They sent me home. It, I was in so much pain for a few days. I remember calling them and they, they said, well, of course it's worse than the brain surgery. There's so many more nerves in your back. And I was like, well, you didn't prepare me for this at all. But eventually that healed. And then I started chemo. And fortunately, I'll just wrap up the back story of the backstory of the back, where they ended up doing the same high, high dose targeted radiation to the two new tumors on my spine after I'd started chemo. And ultimately all those procedures went well. And, and I think as of today, I, I don't have any disease in my spine. So that, that feels really good. You know, that, that first symptom, um, arguably the beginning of everything is, has been close, looking like I will live a while, but something eventually needs to be done to reinforce the spine again. But yeah, I'm very happy that that part of my body is successfully treated. So you, you are going on to the chemotherapy mm -hmm. and so how, do, how does that go? How, what are, what are your, what is your experience? What kind of chemotherapy was it? Um, how did you tolerate it? That kind of thing. Yeah. So they started me on 
I think it's Gemzar and Cisplatin. In the cancer community, we usually just shorten it to Gemsis. It's kind of the like standard first line treatment for cholangiocarcinoma. And I was really prepared to be bald and bedridden. You know, I, and I live alone. I think I'd mentioned that, but there was also concern of how am I going to, you know, take care of myself if I'm really sick. And my building is really old and I live on the top floor, the fourth floor, and there isn't an elevator. So even just worrying about, is it going to be hard to get up to my apartment? So I was really going into it, you know, still ready for battle, if you will, but but certainly concerned. I do remember my oncologist called me the day before I started infusions to say, we should have talked about fertility because I'm a young adult and normally they'd have someone in my role maybe freeze their eggs or something ahead of time. But you know, I hadn't thought of that. And, and he apologized for not saying it sooner, but he said, we really need to go forward with treatment. And you're stage four. And typically, you know, we don't, we don't do that process with stage four patients anyway. So that, that hit me really hard. I think it, that's just kind of when it really sunk in what was happening and how much my life was going to be impacted. I kept thinking like, I was so angry to be diagnosed and stubborn. And I kept thinking, I'm, I'm not going to go down like this and I'm going to fight this and I'm going to get back to normalcy. I'm going to do these aggressive treatments. And maybe a year from now, I'll be back at my advertising job, maybe pregnant, maybe just, you know, on the path and benign. So that was really one of those crucial moments that it hit and it hit hard and it let me know what was going on and that things weren't going to be the same again. So <laughs> that's, that, that was just a key moment for me with, with starting chemo. I, I, I had a port and installed pretty immediately and I'm so glad I did because I I bruise easily and my veins would have been ripped to shreds so yeah I, I went to the university for chemo and it was it was in the fall now of 2020 and remember this all started first with the brain tumor in July and and the diagnosis in August and the back surgery and we're finally we had an early snowfall that year so it wasn't that long waiting until between it was October it was the first snow of the season and at my cancer clinic the infusion, the infusion center is really nice and we kind of have our own suites and, and I had a window suite and so I got to watch the first snowfall on campus and now I'd gone to school at the University of Minnesota so it's this kind of full circle and a familiar place and the recliners are comfortable and there have been this great uh, my oncologist main assistant or medical secretary we'd been on the phone back and forth now for a few months like I, I'm not going to say daily but often like I felt like we knew each other you know he talked about when my back surgery finally got scheduled, they were jumping up and down and dancing and like, you know, we'd kind of grown this connection and I finally got to meet him in person. His name's Mike. He did the, they do like chemo 101, your first visit and just go through everything. And overall, it wasn't nearly as bad as I expected it to be. I went home and, and still I, I felt pretty good. Um, yeah, very little side effects. And, and this was, um, protocol was two weeks on, one week off. Two weeks on, one week off, and it went well. I did that through the fall. Didn't need all the all the Gatorade and Ensure. I I sacked in my shelves. Wasn't really losing my hair. Um, so uh, did that through the fall. And right before New Year's, it was December 29th. I had scans that showed I I was stable and my primary tumor had shrunk a lot. So that was really exciting. And and okay. I felt confident I'm winning this. And then, so now I, I got to the point where I started talking about what are we going to do with this primary tumor? You know, when you're stage four, immediately you're inoperable. I didn't want to believe that. I wanted to get there. So I wanted to get all my meds under control. And so far the brain tumor was, my spinal meds were. My memory does get a little blurry at this phase, but what happened was I decided to go back to the Mayo Clinic to get their thought and what they were going to do with what they would do with my primary tumor. You know, would they do resection or radiation or ablation or I wanted their opinion. And that oncologist I really liked had retired. So they sent me with someone new and she read my scans and said, you know, I think something's wrong. The chemo's not working. The cancer is progressing, which was mortifying. And I was so angry at my oncologist and I called him and, and he called me back right away and we realized that no, she was wrong. She'd been comparing the wrong scans. So he told me that I relayed that to her. She, she called me back. She said, you're right. You're right. I'm sorry. I was looking at the wrong comparison, but it looks like the chemo is keeping you stable. I said, okay, so what would you do for my primary tumor? And she said, we wouldn't do anything for your primary tumor because it's already spread. She said, I'm really sorry. It, it's too late for you. It's going to keep spreading. And I was furious. 
because I didn't want to believe this. And the it's not the path I'd set out to go on. Even even that first Mayo doctor had said, we'll, we'll get the cancer under control until we can cure the incurable. She said either it's going to keep growing elsewhere in other organs or or my primary tumor, those were kind of the only two outcomes. What I kind of wrote that off and went back. Although this is where it gets blurry, it, it come to fruition that there were two tiny lesions in my pelvis that needed to be treated. So I wasn't necessarily stable anymore. It had moved to my pelvis. So we switched me to a different chemo that's more aggressive. We treated those two tumors with high dose radiation and, and I kept going with this new chemo, chemo that you know, I still tolerated it pretty well. I just was tired more than anything. Do you remember the, the type of chemo it was, the new chemo? Yeah, uh, full fox, it's called. Um, it's one where you you bring the, the chemo pump home with you. You wear this, you know, not so stylish fanny pack and over 46 hours it infuses. And that's every other week. So I did that through the spring. And then in the spring we learned, okay, things are stable still. And things are looking good and, and I'm feeling good. But then that summer I'd, I'd wanted to take a trip kind of to celebrate. Um, so I went out to the West Coast, kind of drove the coastline, um, flew into San Francisco and drove up to Portland and Acadia. And uh, so in this time, you know, I'd had this double vision this whole year. And and on this trip, it it pretty pronounced fixed itself. I, I was around the, you know, curvy roads of, around the cliffs and everything. And I was like, oh my God, I'm seeing single. This is incredible. So uh, just a little backstory. They, all the doctors had said I was going to need surgery on the eye muscle to treat the double vision. Um, but my ophthalmologist, that's the fancy eye doctor, wanted to wait for the eye to be stable for three months, but it slowly kept getting better and better and better. And eventually it corrected itself completely. So that was really um, encouraging too. And, and he was really excited about that. And, you know, he, he said, jokingly, I think like, if, if your body can do this, it can do anything. And what, whatever the case, I, I take that with me too. Like, I think it's really encouraging because everyone was pretty sure I, I need surgery. Um, but my nerves said, no, you don't <laughs> and fixed it. So yeah, it's this summer. I'm on this full Fox. I'm stable. I'm still stable. Eventually we hit the fall. My oncologist says, okay, I think we should push for resection, which is what I'd wanted from the start. They say that's the only curative route for cholangeal carcinoma. And I was really excited. You know, I was like, I've proved everyone wrong. We're going to resect this tumor. And it gotten pretty small. I think it was like two by three centimeters down. It started out like, I think five by seven, but so I was like, this is great. I could actually beat this. But then I talked to a couple surgeons and they weren't so enthusiastic. The first surgeon said it'd be really, really risky just where the tumor is. And he, and he would be really hesitant to attempt that surgery. And so I got a second opinion from another surgeon who said, he said he, I, he didn't expect me to recover and I shouldn't spend what little time I have left in pain trying to. So that was another moment kind of like I had at Mayo where I'm just angry and how dare you say that? And I'm, I'm going to prove you wrong. And uh, yeah, so ultimately I decided to go with Y90 radiation. And I was set up with an internal radiologist who I really liked her. She decided to go with a really, really high dosage of radiation. I think her goal was to, to kill this tumor so that resection wouldn't even be necessary. But typically this Y90 procedure is just meant to stabilize um, a tumor, maybe shrink it. Sometimes it'll shrink it enough for resection. But for me, it was more of the placement that um, made resection troublesome. So anyway, I have this Y90 in October of 2021. And, and you don't know how, how well it goes until like three months after. I started having a lot of abdominal pain about a month following this. And I needed to be hospitalized. And, and, and we did a nerve block. And that really helped. But ultimately, we get through. I get through all the side effects. And, and now I think it's, it's February, maybe January. We look at the scans and we see that dead tissue has now replaced the tumor. The tumor is gone, so we're thrilled. You know, I, I think, I don't think we can say definitively it's dead without a biopsy, sure. but it looks pretty dead. And, and the radiologist is, is very thrilled and confident. So we're going to keep watching it, but it looks like it may have, you know, killed the primary tumor as well. It's incredible. That's great. So yeah. That, that's that's a lot of talking, but that kind of brings us up to today. All the tumors have been treated. Admittedly, so my oncologist wants to keep the cancer at bay now. 
So he wanted to keep me on my chemotherapy, which I have, I struggle with, but I did drop the oxaliplatin from, from the full Fox combination over the summer because my neuropathy is really bad and treatments have been a lot easier since then, but you know, I'm still doing chemo. Ideally, they want me to do it every other week. I've been traveling a lot and taking a lot of breaks so far. Things are still looking good and stable. So I plan to continue doing that. Yeah. I mean, our big picture plan is to hold on until something really game changing comes along and I can get off the chemo and, and, and there's something curative that is just really effective and, and game changing. And, you know, the way medicine is, is advancing so quickly, I can see that happening. I mean, maybe the next five years, maybe hopefully sooner. So that, that's where I'm at today. I, I talked to your ear off far more than I expected to. I'm so no, sorry. No, no, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. And, and you know, I, I have as much time as you have. So, so don't, don't pay attention to the, <laughs> the okay. technology. Here. Wow. So you've been through quite the ordeal the last couple of years. Uh, you did mention neuropathy associated with the oxaliplatin. Could you describe for folks what that was like and, and how you came to the conclusion with your doctor to, to make that change? Sure. So neuropathy is something they certainly told me to look for with this chemotherapy because it's a very common problem and, and often what leads to the discontinuation of it. I didn't have any problems until maybe the sixth or seventh infusion, but then it got hard to write. Handwriting in particular was hard. And we also noticed when I went on this trip out west, I fell a few times, which is a little ab abnormal. And I, talking with a nurse, you know, we came to the realization I, I can't feel my feet and that's why I'm falling. And so that's kind of when we decided, okay, you're young enough that if we drop the oxaliplatin now, you know, the neuropathy might not be permanent. So it's been about six months now. I still have it, but it's, I think it's getting better. I, I did do a little bit of acupuncture. Um, they say that that can help with neuropathy. It might have. Yeah, I, I can see it clearing up, but it'll, like my eye, my eye took a full year before it fixed itself. I can see my, my neuropathy maybe taking close to a year as well. For a while there, because of the double vision, you had more than two cat times. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, was, that was not the double vision. That, that is reality, I hope. So I want to sort of talk about the journey from, from the perspective of, of changes that you've had to make. So certainly you told your employer at some point, how did that conversation go for you? Sure. Yeah. I actually, so I'd lost my, I was contracting for a role the end of 2019 that was meant to become full-time in 2020, but then the pandemic hit and they actually dropped our con their contractors. So I lost my job with the pandemic and enrolled in, in Medicaid, coincidentally, like a month before the diagnosis. And, and Medicaid has been incredible, the best insurance I've ever had. So that was a weird silver lining, but I, I decided to try freelancing a little bit with different agencies. And, and I was very open from the beginning about my cancer and everything. And, and um, you know, professional and personal lines kind of blur in, in the creative field. So everybody knew what was going on, but, but people were very just understanding. And I'd worked with a couple of ag agencies, but, and, and they were so understanding about, you know, take your time, let us know what you can do and what it's okay if you need to drop out of a job, et cetera. Everyone was really, really supportive, but you know, I, it also came down to in the end, I, I didn't feel good about the work I was submitting. I just didn't feel confident about it. And that felt really just uncomfortable. So I just said, you know what, I think I need to focus on treatments. Hopefully we can reconnect in the future when, when I'm feeling better and, and work together again. And you know, everyone was very understanding. There, there was one agency where I had to kind of officially off board, like, you know, um, go through my laptop and return the laptop and keys. And, and that was a little, a little emotional, but you know, they expressed like, we really would like to bring you back someday. We didn't expect you to be gone that long. It was gone a year. <laughs> it was a full year before they finally said, okay, can we have our computer back? And, and, you know, but you know, I, like I said, I, I, I voiced, I'd like to work with them again. If, if, you know, conditions allow for it, they'd love that. I'm, I'm hoping that'll be the case. Hopefully as soon as maybe this summer, I mean, I, navigating the insurance and working and cancer has been really, really tricky. It's like I mentioned the Medicaid is, is so such good coverage, but I really can't make any money if I, if I want to stay on Medicaid and 
yeah, so I'm on disability, but it's really, really hard to make a meets too. Uh, you know, you get to a stage of at what point am I working, but paying more for medical expenses versus not working, not making money. You know, it's just, it's such a bizarre situation I found myself in, but I think uh, I have a friend who's a PhD in healthcare economics and he kind of mapped out like, you know, I could go into like other government assisted healthcare programs and make a little bit more. And, and it gets to a point where you can, you know, there, there's a line you can cross where you'll start paying more for medical expenses than you're making, but it's been really, you know, at 2019, I, I made almost six figures and now I'm applying for food stamps. It's just been such a, you know, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a little hard in that sense, but I mean, I'd like to say maybe good for me to see what it's like, but yeah, my lifestyle has certainly changed a lot. And then, um, you know, the burden of not only navigating the systems, but also just managing the day-to-day, -day, your appointments, making sure that you're getting to and from your, your treatment. How have you managed through that? Yeah, you know, it's that's that's also another large reason I went on disability. It feels like a full-time job just navigating cancer treatments, cancer. Um, you know, I I stopped driving when my double vision appeared. Um, I gave up my car. So for a while I was getting rides to all my appointments from like my brother and a friend and eventually like my brother, his wife had a baby and now I use Uber and Lyft a lot to go to and from chemo and appointments. And, you know, I was just thinking this morning about what would I have done 10 years ago because I, I get everything delivered, my groceries, you know, like Target products, everything's delivered. And then, yeah, I do Lyft and Uber and otherwise, you know, DoorDash too for meals or whatever. You know, I just think like, 10 years ago, these services weren't nearly what they are now. I really don't know what I would have done, but, you know, things coinciding with the pandemic so much have been interesting. Just like, you know, some of that might have changed anyway, certainly the staying in more and ordering food in and that type of stuff. But then, yeah, also living in Minneapolis, things have changed a lot. For example, my, my neighborhood has a lot of carjackings now, and I only have street parking, so I'm thinking about getting a car, but... I don't know if I want to deal with that. I've always been the type where I, I've struggled to ask for help. I, I really prefer to be self-sufficient. And I found myself in a position where I need to ask for help. So I'm learning how to do that, especially like for rides or, you know, I'm finding there's such a strong like young adults with cancer community online I've connected with. And, and a lot of things will kind of gripe about or vent about is people offer like, well, let me know if there's anything I can do for you which is great, but it's such a like kind of empty offer. And, um, you know, so kind of learning how to, how to say like, awesome, I could really use a ride to the pharmacy tomorrow. Yeah, swallowing my pride and, and taking people up on these offers, whether they not, whether they know or not, I'm going to. As far as earlier, we were talking about navigating the, the, the system. You know, I have to spend a lot of time on the phone and communicating between different parties. And it blows my mind. I, I just can't imagine if like English were my first language or I were a really elderly person, what that would be like. Um, it's really, really difficult. It's built to be difficult. And it proves it succeeds with that. I'm on the phone all the time, just, you know, managing insurance quirks or, just even communication between different doctors and it's so much. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't know how I would do it without being on disability right now. But anyway, the support you were talking about, I do have a dad who lives nearby. He's, he helps a little bit. Yeah. One of my brothers has been pretty helpful, but he has two little kids and runs a business. So he's kind of tied up and I'm at this, this age in my life where all my friends and peers are are having babies. I feel like everyone's having a baby right now, which is another reminder to me of what I'm missing. It's kind of watching from the sidelines. I mentioned I'm, I'm 35. I was diagnosed at 34. Um, I still thought, you know, a family was ahead of for me. And that's been really, really hard seeing other people's life go forward as mine's just paused. And 
it takes up a lot of their time, which I understand, and I'm really happy for them. But I think it has been harder maybe to have that that level of support that might be there otherwise. And my mom had early onset Alzheimer's. She was diagnosed maybe 10 years ago. I think because a lot of young adults with cancer move home with their parents and, and really rely on their parents. And I haven't really had that ability. And my mom, you know, she was in the late stages for maybe the past five or six years. And throwing the pandemic on top of it. I didn't see her at all 2020 because, you know, they weren't allowing visitors. And I saw her a couple of times in 2021. And, you know, I told her about my illness, but she certainly, she didn't know who I was nonetheless that I had cancer. Um, in a way, I'm, I'm glad she was spared watching this, but she died in December. And um, yeah, thank you. It's It's been, you know, she's been gone so long. The, disease took her away so long ago that it isn't a big, you know, disruption to my life. And it is kind of a nice closure. You know, sometimes I think, boy, if I had that support that other people do of their mom, you know, and my mom was such a mom's mom. She was so sweet and maternal. And, you know, when anybody, when you're feeling sick, you you just have that intuition of you want your mom. But she she got sick pretty early in my adulthood and so i feel like i haven't ever had a mom as an adult so again just kind of forcing myself to be self-sufficient and i guess that's that's where it comes in with me relying more on programs that are available like instacart and uber and stuff like that you know a, a lot of people offer anytime you need a ride or anything like that and, and i struggle to take them up on that offer but i know if it, it really came down to it i i could and i would and you know I, i'm lucky i have even you know some neighbors nearby i'm really close with to help out and i, I mentioned i've been traveling a lot and so they they watch the cats for me while i'm gone and that helps and you know i i certainly like like i said i have people lots of people i've been very very fortunate with my support system that i i can't say i utilize it to the full ex extent but i know it's there and a lot of that's been because i've been very public about my diagnosis and experience and i update people on facebook with maybe once a month or every other month i've started a blog i've been bad at maintaining it but you know, uh, pe people have been so supportive and, you know, some friends did a GoFundMe for me when this first started and, th and that was so successful. And, you know, I joke, I felt like George Bailey and It's a Wonderful Life, you know, when that when that was first set up. And I think we exceeded our goal in the first day and like people, you know, a year and a half later contribute, um, even strangers. And, and I don't have it out like in the front. I have like on Twitter, a link to my blog and people like dig and find it. And, and it just warms my heart. Like, Oh my God. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of like, and I never realized how, how like loved and supportive I was. And yeah, that's been really, really helpful. And I think kept me going strong. I think some, some cancer patients really hate hearing how strong and inspiring they are and stuff like that. So I, I don't mind it. Um, I think it's a compliment and for me, it helps me, it keeps me going and it, and it makes me want to maintain that level of strength. And, and be that source of strength and inspiration for people. And, you know, some people might say like, oh, what, I'm just not dying, blah, blah. And, and, and that may be the case, but, but I think it's a lot more than that. I mean, I'm choosing to do these aggressive treatments that like these other doctors kind of um, discourage and then kind of discouraged my ability to do them as well as, you know, their cooperation in them. So I don't know, I, I think I'm making an effort and, and I, I'm glad to know that that people know to keep going when they when they get my updates or or maybe just remember like well they don't have it as bad as they think they do you know like you know the pandemic's really hard and everything and I definitely I think everyone has the right to their struggles absolutely but oh imagine adding like stage four cancer diagnosis and a mom dying and a job loss and a breakup on top of it and still just hanging in there as, I, as I'm doing my best to do. Yeah, that, that helps me going. It's kind of a convoluted jumbled response, but. No, no, no. And, and it's as complex and and challenging as, as life is complex and challenging. And certainly all of any one of the things that you had described are tough and challenging and devastating. 
and to have many of those things happen in close proximity to one another when you are 35. That is something that, that many will not experience. And part of the challenge and the opportunity that we have with sharing our journeys and certainly yours is that we generate the empathy for others going through whatever they might be going through. And so thank you. I wanted to, first of all, Betsy, thank you so much for, for taking the time today. You know, you've shown courage. You've shown perseverance. Many of the things that you said where you've advocated for yourself, where you've gone, gone more aggressive because you felt you could handle it despite objections from, from folks who might say this might not be right or what's best. And that takes a lot of courage. Thank and so, you. so I want to congratulate you for, for doing that for yourself, getting the second opinion to ensure that things were happening in the right way. Those are all things that other young people encountering cholangiocarcinoma, metastatic cancer, they will learn from your experience and they will get hope from your experience because you're here. You know? Well, thank you. And yeah, I didn't expect to get as emotional and in depth as I, as I maybe did, but I'm, I'm sure it doesn't hurt. I will say one thing I hear so often from not only my friends, but a lot of people just like, I, I, I don't know what I'd do in your situation. I'd fall apart. I couldn't do it. But I truly, really think like nobody knows how they react in a situation until they're in it. I, I would say the same thing to someone else before I was in this situation. Like, I think people are are stronger than they give themselves credit. And when you're you're forced to be, you don't really have a choice. You'll do it. Um, so yeah, I think in general, people shouldn't sell themselves short and assume they'd fall apart right away because there's no way to know until you're actually facing that situation. And, and I think you said it perfectly. You get into a mode where it, it is survival. You, mm -hmm. the, there are things that must be done. Um, and, and I said, I think you said it perfectly. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know. I don't, you might not want to include this, but I continue to hear how hard post-treatment is and how much harder post-treatment is than active treatment because of the PS, PTSD and everything. I, I still want to get to that stage of post-treatment, um, even though, but, but yeah, I, I, I've heard it echoed a lot that when you're in treatment, you are in survival mode of like, what do we do next? Let's do this. And, and, and it, it is very, it's a strong foundation to like hold on to. I, I, I don't know, it just naturally occurs, but I appreciate having that there. No, that, that, makes, that makes so much sense. It, it is a way to cope. It is a way to manage through. It is a way to find the reserve. You know, we can spend a lot of time focusing on this is now my life. Mm -hmm. And in a way, what you're doing when you're focusing on what's next is you're actually taking away from whatever is going on today and looking forward, which is as as much as you can do in some circumstances. Yeah, absolutely. And and I do certainly have my my days and moments where I, I have a really good cathartic cry and breakdown and it feels really good. Um, you know, I, just, there's you hear all the think positive and everything and I I agree I think there's a strong mind body connection I do that helps healing but I don't think thinking positive and denying the the pain and grief and everything is is possible or healthy I think it's important to have that the grieving and emotion just to get it out yeah yeah, yeah. and if I may it, it it appears to me that a part of today for you was a little bit of that I yeah I think it was. I have my uh, therapy tomorrow, but I think this was a little bit of a, a little taste of that as well. Absolutely. If Atticus and Bumby could talk, what would they say today to you? Oh boy, I think they'd say, I think they see me as mom because I took them home when they were tiny little little babies and they'd, they'd say, mom, you're, you're really damn strong and and we're with you till the end and we're, we're going to we're going to cuddle with you and, and comfort you as much as we can, but we're always very happy when you get home from your trips and we love when you give us what food. <laughs> and, uh, where will you go next? I know you're, you're traveling lately. Where will you go next? What, uh, what? Puerto Rico next week. Oh, wonderful. I went to Puerto Rico. Uh, when was it? Um, well, so it's a long story. We, I lost my passport, so we were supposed to go somewhere else. So um, we're like, okay, where can you go without a passport? Puerto Rico. It's a big bonus. <laughs> great time though. Oh, Puerto Rico is, is fantastic. The food is great. There's a um, a bioluminescent bay. You can go and, and take a canoe out and see the see the bioluminescent, uh, I guess it's plankton or something like that. Yeah, that lights up. That's, that lights up a bit. Um, so 
it, it, it's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. I think you're going to have a great time. And Betsy, um, thank you. I would I would love to stay in touch. You know, yeah. maybe have another one of these conversations in three months or six months and check in and, and you know, have, have another update to, to the journey to help others on theirs. And I absolutely wholeheartedly believe that your journey is going to help others as well. So thank you so much. It was really great talking to you and, and I'm really, I really admire what you guys are doing and, and think it's really, really valuable. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, you, you are, it's <laughs> called Healthful Heroes. You're the hero. Thank you so much, Betsy. Enjoy the rest of the day. Good luck with the maintenance thing and uh, we'll talk soon. Sounds good. Take care. <laughs> Thank you, Bye. Betsy. Have a good day.